Hello everybody. Um, my name is Hermann Einzele. I'm uh, based in Würzburg in Germany and it's my great pleasure to report from the Myeloma 2022 in Scottsdale and it's a great pleasure for me for the discussion to have two real experts with me on T-cell engaging therapies in myeloma, Professor Nina Shah and Professor Tom Martin from California. And the topic of our discussion today should be challenges and opportunities of T-cell engaging therapies in myeloma. And now we have already one T-cell product approved. The second <coughs> approval is soon coming. Probably we also have a T-cell engager targeting BCMA being available commercially also maybe at the end of this year or beginning of next year. What do you think? Where are we going to see the T-cell engaging therapies in myeloma? Will it be the very last, la, late stage of the disease, the relapsed refractory patient, or you do, do you perceive that we are going to move treatment with T-cell engaging therapies to earlier lines of therapy? Lina, what, um, what's your opinion? Yeah, so in, in the United States now, we have two CAR T-cell therapies that are approved, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we are really excited to anticipate the approval of, of a bispecific T-cell engager, hopefully at the end of the year. And mm -hmm. I think what's going to happen is we're going to realize that even in the late stages of myeloma, we're getting such great responses that mm -hmm. it seems only natural that we'd want to move these more proximal mm -hmm. in the patient's treatment course. And I really look forward to some of the clinical trials that are being conducted now, both with with CAR T-cells and T-cell engagers in the earlier stages of disease, really to get this benefit sooner than later mm. for our patients. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, in our natural progression of myeloma therapeutics, everything that's currently approved for use in myeloma had a single agent response rate mm. of 20 to 30 percent. Mm. We're now having T-cell engagers, as Nina presented, that have single agent response rates between 50 and 80 percent. That's amazing. And then with CAR T's, 80 to over 90 percent single agent response. So our natural progression is try them in the relapse refractory and then move them in earlier lines of therapy. My guess is that five years from now, these are going to be frontline therapies mm. for most of the patients. And now you, you mentioned already that these treatments are extremely effective, it's extremely high response rates and also quite good tolerability. So do you expect that all other myeloma treatment will disappear and we will only give T-cell engages or CAR T-cells to our patients from the beginning? I would say that um, combinations have, have always been our strategy going mm. forward. So I do think that we're gonna try to put these together to try to get 100% response mm. rate. I think that should really be our mm. goal. But not only that is to give them for a certain period of time and then potentially to stop therapy. Mm. So maybe we can use some drugs together for a certain period of time, maybe a year or two years, get MRD negative for that period of time and then just stop. What do you think, Nina? Yeah, I think that if, if we could take anything that's a benefit from this, I mean, how are you going to get better than 98% respon response rate in the relapse refractory setting? So one of the things that I love about CAR T-cells is that it's a one-and-done treatment. So mm -hmm. that's something I would love to do for patients up front to mm -hmm. get that to be something that they can have a treatment-free interval. But then specifically with the bispecifics, even though they are weekly or whatever the schedule is, maybe we could use the benefit of what they do in the relapse refractory, bring them up front, and as Tom was saying, maybe limit the time that mm. patients have to keep going to the oncologist's mm. office. Mm. So that would, I think, really be a new frontier for myeloma patients, not to be on indefinite therapy. Mm. And I think we, we also need these more conventional treatments because it's well known that the higher the tumor load the patient is, is going into these T-cell engaging therapies, the more likely he is having severe side effects like cytokine release syndrome or neurotoxicity. And also, it might also increase the risk of resistance. So I think we need some kind of debulking before we actually interfere with T-cell engaging therapies. Now, you have already pointed out that it's a treatment that is maybe once it's, it's a one-shot therapy. So are we going to see disappearance of maintenance, disappearing of consolidation if we use 
these uh, T-cell engaging therapies? That's a really good question because right now, as the studies were done uh, for the relapse refractory setting, patients only got one dose of CAR T-cell therapy, for example. But now there are studies going on to see if we can extend the efficacy of the CAR T-cell therapy by having immunomodulatory agents. Mm. And I think that might help. But I, one of the things that we're really excited about is learning from our past experience, kind of going to your previous conversation about con uh, combinations, that maybe the immunomodulatory agents will pair best with the T-cell engagers. Mm. Um, and so there might be some maintenance in there, but it would be an oral pill, for example, mm. or something less frequent. I don't know, what mm. do you think? Yeah, in the CAR-T uh, scenario at the current time, we, we have what I call is flattening of the line envy. <laughs> we don't have flattening a line. We don't have patients that are cured. And in fact, people are relapsing at three years, at four years, at five years. Mm -hmm. And the question is why? And will some type of maintenance prevent that, th mm -hmm. that dormant cell mm -hmm. from you know, reactivating two and three years later? So I think that's a really good question. And what to use as maintenance if we were going to do it is do we use cell mods or, or you know, immunomodulatory drugs to, to try to tell the microenvironment, go back to normal, go back to your usual, mm -hmm. keep everything under control? Or do we use more? aggressive therapy like T-cell engagers after CARS mm. to try to wipe out every last little cell. Mm. I don't know, it's, what do you think? You no, know, I think that's, that's the, the strategy I think we, we're moving into, that we really try to get the patient in the best possible response and then try to keep the patient in the response. And I think it will also depend on how long the CAR T-cells are persisting. I think we've seen this nice a paper from Carl June that in CLL patients, the CAR T cells can persist for 10 years and, and thereby really probably curing these patients. But in, in myeloma at the moment, we don't see this long-term persistence. And, and that's why I, I, I'm with you. I think we need something in addition or maybe just to prolong the persistence of the CAR T cells and to, to prevent the escape of these dormant cells um, from really inducing a, a relapse of the multiple myeloma. You know, the, I, I would say in the last you know, 10 to 15 years, we really have not innovated with autologous transplant, right? Mm. It just hasn't mm. been a, a strategy that we could add on or change the prep mm. or et cetera. And so there's been no innovation. Mm. This is the beginning of cars, right? This is the beginning of innovation in my mind. Just like you said, can we make a more persistent? Can we target two antigens? Mm. Can, what can we do to change the T cells that make them healthier, mm. more proliferative, more persistent? This is really gonna be fun for the next five mm. to 10 years. Yeah, I think the interesting thing, just like as you pointed out, it's we don't have that persistent CAR T cell for years mm. on end. First of all, we don't have the data yet. And secondly, mm. it seems like we can't find them mm. for most patients, as particularly uh, since there is no plateau on the curve, as Tom mentioned. But what is interesting is that it seems like you can retreat people, for example, targeting mm. BCMA. There's also, as we are discussing uh, at, at this conference, GPRC5D targeting mm. T cells. It could be where if we find enough different antigens, enough different types of T cell products, a patient could progress after three years, get another lymphodepletion, mm. get another CAR T cell, have another three years, mm. and we could stretch people out because it would be a new CAR T cell therapy. It wouldn't mm. be something they would reject. So that might be one way to get a lot of, or minimal treatment doses with a lot of time. Mm. Now, I think you, you already mentioned some of the challenges that we face also with T cell engages and with CAR T cells. So obviously, the persistence of the CAR T cells could be an, an, a problem. The T cell engages, the question is how long do we have to give them until the optimal response? Are we going to give them like the, the lenalidomide forever? I don't think that's the way to use bispecific antibodies. And, and the other problem is, as you also mentioned, is target antigen loss. So we have seen target antigen loss. We know that in CD19 directed CAR T cell therapies, 50 to 75 percent of heavily pretreated patients are losing the target antigen. And I guess in myeloma, we'll, we have now probably something like 4%, but I think the more we are using it and the earlier we are using it, we probably see more target antigen loss. So we need additional targets to be addressed with the T cell engaging therapy. So you mentioned GPRC5D, so are there other targets that we might actually use in the future for T cell engagers or yeah. T cells? 
I, I'm excited about the data with GPRC 5D, not only for the bispecific uh, T cell engagement therapy with telkinumab, but also with the upcoming CAR T cell yeah. therapy. And then now we have Sevastamab, which targets yeah. FCRH5, which we're also discussing uh, at this meeting. And I think that the more we do investigation in targets and target antigen discovery, the better it's going to be. And what we might find out is that there are some subclones of myeloma cells, like Tom was saying, the dormant cells that tend mm. to express certain antigens more, or maybe it's not a CD. 138 positive mm. cell. Maybe it's a precursor cell and we could target that. But I think that the more we put into antigen discovery, we are going to have a greater variety of therapies for mm. the patients. I do have this feeling that you know, five or 10 years from now, we're going to have the menu card mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to flow these cells and see what's on the cell surface and say, yes, I'll take check. I'll take the basically the GPRC5D car. And then for maintenance, I'll take mm. the you know, FCRH5 uh, bi-specific, and, and we'll have different type of, uh, you know, menus every time they relapse, we pull out a new menu, what's on the cell surface, and there we go at it. So I do think immunotherapy is not going to just be for first line therapy, it's going to be for second, mm. third, and subsequent line as we go, go forward. It's like my Loma Sushi menu. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 But then right. the question comes up, what's the optimal target, uh, sequencing of the therapy? So should we give CAR T cells first or bi-specifics first? So what, what would you recommend? That's yeah. a really difficult question in the sense that we don't know what's going to be better first, and we mm -hmm. haven't, of course, studied that. We're, we would love to know that answer now. I mean, my preference would be if I could give somebody a CAR T cell therapy first mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. One, it's a one and done mm -hmm. treatment. Two, it uses the healthiest T cells up front mm -hmm. versus if you gave bispecific therapy, you may have exhausted T cells mm -hmm. after years of therapy. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be my preference. But then on the flip side, the logistics may not permit this. So mm -hmm. it might not be that you can give everybody a CAR T cell cell therapy up front and I think we're really going to see sort of a change in how the workflow is for that and and maybe something like we've done with transplant where now we try to make sure everybody has access uh, mm. who's eligible for a transplant would have an apheresis slot um, I don't know what do you think about sequence yeah I, I agree and you know the current data suggests that an, you know 80 to 98 percent response rate with cars I, I want to have that patient get a car first if I can mm. if I have a car T cell slot and I have the ability to give them a car T cell right now I'm going to give them that right now in relapse, right? And then potentially think about uh, basically a T cell engager down the road. But what you said er earlier, I really liked, and that is when we debulk people and then give them a CAR T or give them a T, um, you know, T cell engager, are we gonna have even less toxicity then? Mm. Can we do that all as an outpatient, mm. which would be really great. Mm. And then I think, you know, choosing between one or the other is gonna be really interesting because mm. I think the response rate is probably gonna be pretty similar. Mm. We'll just have to see how that mm. evolves. And do you think that all the patients will nicely respond to CAR T cells and T cell engagers, or are there different subgroups where we still have problems to really get these high remissions and long-term remissions? Yeah, I think the extramedullary mm. uh, patients are really difficult. Mm. Uh, and I'm not sure, sometimes I think CAR is better for them, sometimes I'm not sure. And maybe it's that we don't want them to get to this point. And that goes back to the earlier point, mm. getting these patients treated with effective immunotherapies before their disease is too out of control. Sometimes there's something about the disease biology we don't know. The subgroup analysis suggests that there is something about being high risk that makes it less likely for you to respond, for example, in the cell-to-cell -cell data. Mm. So, so there, that's still a challenge. As as usual with myeloma, great patients do great. Standard risk does great. Uh, and, and high risk patients are a challenge. Would you agree? Completely. And you know, when you look at the silt cell data, in fact, 113 patients signed consent, but 97 were treated. Mm -hmm. And so that difference right there are people that didn't make it to CAR T cell. Mm -hmm. That's the the patients mm. that I think we really have to focus a lot of our energy on, the really proliferative and the tough patients, they could have gotten an off the shelf, mm. potentially a, a T cell engager at mm. that point in time. But the big question is, would, have, would they have responded to that off the shelf mm. you know, TCE at that time? Mm. Um, that is something going forward that I think is really important. That's the unmet need, is mm. those really rapidly progressive people. And hopefully we're not gonna have to address it too much because we're gonna be treating people in remission mm. rather than when they're Mm. you know, six line prior therapies. It's a tough population. You mentioned off the shelf, so there are now also these allo CAR T cells. So how do you think they are going to develop? Are we going to see allo CAR T cells in the future replacing autologous CAR T cells or will the immunological issue that the uh, immunogenicity and maybe also the genetic modification we have to perform to really make them kind of safe without inducing graft versus host disease. 
put such a lot of problems around the allocar T cells that they are not making it into the clinic. So what, what do you think? Yeah, I think allogeneic CAR T cells could be a game changer in mm. the sense that it really eliminates that step mm. of apheresis, which is important um, because it does then increase accessibility, not just for the patients at our large medical centers, mm. but you could imagine that people in smaller medical centers mm. would now have access to off the shelf. Okay, so that's great. But the problem, as you mentioned, is the immunologic rejection. And I really think that allogeneic CAR T cells at the at the first infusion and that first month have to do the job that they came to do. Mm. So they have to put people in deep remissions within that first month before mm. patients' own autologous T cells have recovery. So if we can find a very powerful allogeneic CAR T cell that can do that, I would even be willing to take a 10% hit in the efficacy mm. to increase the availability of mm. that therapy. Mm. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I completely agree. If they can actually cause a significant response in those rapidly progressive patients, that's really key. The other thing that I think the, you know, we, what we need to test and be able to do is to give multiple infusions for these. Mm -hmm. So maybe we give an infusion now, we give another infusion you know, three months later, another mm -hmm. fusion six months later. Maybe that's, it's not just one and done, but three and done. Mm -hmm. And then three and done. But you have to be able to do it without more lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe in that regard, we'll, we'll have a more persistent CAR T cell um, you know, I don't think they'll live forever, obviously, even probably not more than a year, but at least they'll be present maybe for six months or longer mm. and provide that deep myeloma effect, mm. anti-myeloma effect. No, Nina, you're not only an expert on CAR T cells, but also NK cells. <laughs> so what about CAR NK cells? Yeah, I think that CAR NK cells have the potential to be very useful similarly to an allogeneic T cell mm. because it is an off-the-shelf product. And it also is known to not cause graft-versus-host disease. So that allows you to have a better variety in donors. And I do think that having the ability to get these from various donors without worrying about it, uh, without as much engineering as you would need for an mm. allo T cell, may make this more available. What I think will still be a problem is the rejection because mm. ultimately you can't avoid the host uh, immune system. I mean, that mm. has to regenerate at some point, and that's going to be a difficult thing to overcome. So if the NK cells can not only be engineered for an antigen, for example, the CAR NK, but also be infused in conjunction with an antibody to take advantage of that, mm. and that's being done in various NK products, we might have another off-the-shelf option that's going to be very well tolerated. And there's other cell products too, right? It's gamma delta T cells, mm. the NK T cells. All these products need to be tested to see which one really is going to mm. rise to the top as being the best. So again, this is part of innovation with cellular therapy mm. that we haven't been able to do in autologous transplant, et cetera. You know, my feeling is autologous transplant is going to be gone soon. Yeah, that, that was my last question. What do you think about <laughs> autologous stem cell transplant? We, we always, we oh. never agree on this. <laughs> <laughs> Are we still doing it in two or three years? Well, the, you actually, it's, unfortunately, that high dose melphalan does elicit a significant mutation burden in those plasma cells. Mm. I think it makes them more difficult difficult down the road to treat. Mm -hmm. And so I would really like to get rid of high-dose melphalan, and I don't think the literally two to log fold reduction in myeloma burden with an autologous transplant comes close to the four to five log reduction mm -hmm. we see with CARS. All right, Nina. Well, I still think that randomized <laughs> control data will answer these questions, and uh, these questions, unfortunately, the that data, that high quality data, is always five years behind what we're doing now. And so now the question is, are people going to get a car versus a transplant? It might be that it would be a consolidative car after mm. the transplant. So that remains to be seen. I still call melphalan the Brillo pad of, of, of uh, chemotherapy, really digs out those bad myeloma cells. But I agree with Tom. It would be nice to find something a little bit less barbaric. Uh, but I think <laughs> data-wise that we're probably still going to be using it for a few more years. Yeah. Yeah, and and then, then, of course, there is the cost issue. And I think uh, not all the health systems in, in, in worldwide will be able to afford CAR T cells. Yes. So I guess there will be countries that will continue to do autologous stem cell transplantation. Right, there's definitely that. Well, uh, I do believe that, but I also believe that if we can get to a point where we can shorten the therapy to two years, or maybe mm. even three years, 36 months, mm. versus you know my, a myeloma patient's average survival being a you know a decade or longer right mm. now, and they're on therapy 80 to 90 percent of that time. Mm. That is so costly. Yeah, all true. that if we yeah. can get them two years of therapy mm. or three years, that right. gets them the seven, eight, nine years. Mm. That's going to be a huge cost savings, actually. I think. 
Yeah, that's true. And there are a lot more analyses being done now more than ever about the qualities and how much effort we're getting or how much how much bang for our buck we're getting from these. And as that moves in the more proximal lines, we're going to have more data to inform us and better, I think, than we've ever done before as far as acquiring this data. So it's really important for all of us to sort of think of think outside the box about how these immunotherapies may best be used, not only for which right patient, but which type of patient as far as the, the course of myeloma mm -hmm. and then how to position those amongst other therapies. Oh, that was a great discussion. Thanks so much, Nina and Tom. Thank you. It was Thank good you. fun. Thanks.